Hi there, my name is Gavin and I'm keen to share with you a solar energy diverter that I developed for our house here in Melbourne. Um, the motivation behind the development of this diverter as any solar diverter is to obviously maximise uh, the solar production that we uh, have from our panels on the roof of our house here um, and in our case to charge uh, two electric vehicles and also to heat water via a resistive element hot water service. Um, our solar system produces, uh, we've got an 8.3 kilowatt array on the roof, um, three phase uh, SMA uh, inverter here. Our solar system produces in the order of 11.3, 11.4 megawatt hours per year. Um, of that, um, we export about 6.4 megawatt hours per year. Um, we're wanting to ensure that we use as much solar energy as we can because we've got made the investment, use as much as we can to charge the cars and heat the water. Um, and a device like this can help immensely in terms of just automating that process without us having to manually switch on devices and whatever. Um, um, so there's, in terms of diversion, there's uh, a multitude of ways of doing it. Uh, uh, most simple is to just switch on appliances when the sun is shining, uh, but that becomes a little tedious after a while, particularly maybe if we're not in the house or we're out. Uh, so this unit takes care of that. The motivation behind uh, me building one myself uh, was that the commercially available units on the market uh, I found were expensive, uh, probably $1,100 for a three-phase unit that would allow switching of the hot water service and possibly the charging of one car, but in this case I've got two cars. And so I found that inflexibility, um, also compared to the high price of those units, I, I don't know why they're so expensive, um, led me to um, investigating options available uh, where I came across a website openenergymonitor.org which is a fantastic resource for those wishing to uh, explore uh, energy diversion um, and that had basically a lot of the materials uh, even the basic code which was wonderful for development for development of of the unit that I have here when it comes to energy diversion the basic logic is fairly straightforward uh, what you're doing is monitoring uh, energy production and then based on that you're triggering devices. Um, so when, when I was looking at that initially I thought a very simple system would be to measure the output from our inverter only. Uh, I wouldn't have to worry about power flow direction because even at night time the quiescent draw of the inverter is fairly low or very low relative to the production when obviously the sun is shining. I thought initially I'd just make a very simple system that uh, measured the output for the inverter and when the inverter was outputting a sufficient uh, capacity, say 2000 watts, then I would switch on, say, our hot water service, which, uh, which has a smaller element located in the bottom of it, which I've done, uh, which is 1800 watts, and it would switch that on. Um, that simple system was one that I built initially. Uh, it worked well. But the difficulty with that approach is that you're not actually monitoring other energy use within the household. You're only measuring the output from the diverter. And the issue you've got there is that uh, it's not taking into account the dishwasher or other uh, energy consuming uh, devices in the house. And indeed, you may be drawing from the grid when you're switching on other appliances through the diverter. Um, after some consideration and finding the Open Energy, Open Energy Monitor.org website, I moved to a different approach which looked at uh, energy flow into and out of the household. And the reality is that that approach isn't uh, considerably more complex than what I had built originally. Um, uh, being on a three phase system, it's a little more complex in that we have more uh, things to sense within the house. And power flow um, measurement, power direction measurement, requires measurement both of uh, current and voltage. Okay, uh, so a little more complex, but not considerably so. 
Uh, in our case, I think it was a great idea to go that extra step to make something that was a little more complex, but would, would uh, actually monitor power consumption for the house, for the entire household, and the net energy production that we were exporting to the grid. Uh, one thing I should point out with all projects involving mains uh, wiring is that if you're not confident or authorised to be doing it, uh, I'd really recommend you uh, engage the services of uh, an electrician to help out, as I did here with the, um, with the uh, wiring of the uh, power points for each separate phase. Um, uh, and also for the output of um, the switching devices that you're using in your specific application. Here is a close-up um, view of the diverter, and I've just got this uh, stick here. Um, at the top here we have a display which shows uh, the mode, and I'll go through the modes in a moment and uh, obviously power production, diversion level, uh, and uh, confirmation of which devices are being switched on or are on at that time. Uh, we have here Arduino Nano, uh, which is a cheap as chips uh, microcontroller. Um, we have down here, you'll see three transformers, AC transformers, nine volt transformers. Uh, I've mounted those in the case, but there are options obviously of using AC plug packs, uh, which would ensure, well, which would mean that you wouldn't need to have AC voltages within the device. Um, over here, just in the background, you may see mounted both on the side and at the rear, they're your uh, uh, biasing and voltage divider boards that are used for both the current and voltage sensing. Uh, what you can't see here, through this uh, input at the top here, uh, just at the uh, very top, um, you'll see the wires coming down at the side of the display there. The current transformers are located at a um, fuse board on the uh, rear of this wall here. And they're obviously sensing uh, the level of current flow on each of the three phases. Um, and these devices with uh, heat sinks on the outside are solid state relays that are used basically to do the switching work for the devices. And here you can see a hot water service and the two on the side are for cars. And uh, we'll, I'll go through maybe a little later the rationale of using solid state uh, devices, but these could also be uh, contactors um, or, or um, uh, heavy duty relays. The entire system runs from a five volt supply that I've just got supplied from a USB plug pack. If we then now look at the display, at this stage, um, I've got it set in a mode I call hot water service only at 400 watts. So essentially the logic there is that as long as we're producing a minimum of 400 watts, the hot water service will switch on. Now we have a 1800 watt element, as I mentioned earlier, in our hot water service. So you might say, well, why would you want that? Well, it's winter time in um, uh, Australia at the moment. And... Um, there may be overcast days. As it happens, today is a very sunny day. Um, we're actually in the second line there, you'll see total real power is 3.6, 3.7 kilowatts. Um, is it what, that's what we're exporting to the grid. Uh, so we have more than sufficient energy to obviously hit our water at, at this point in time. Um, but I'll go through the modes with you. You just push this button on the side here. And with each button, it just scrolls through the different modes. So essentially, on the power measurement mode, what we're showing here is how much power uh, we're either importing or exporting to the grid. Positive is that we're exporting energy to the grid. Negative would be that we're importing energy from the grid. Uh, power diversion is zero because I've, I've not set any devices to be switched on in this mode. And uh, the divert status is all appliances are off. And the hot water service only mode, the uh, logic here is the cut-in is at 1.8 kilowatts, so uh, which is the uh, the um, capacity of our of the bottom element in our hot water service. So the logic here is simply that as long as we're producing 1.8 kilowatts or more, 
uh, or exporting 1.8 kilowatts or more um, is that the hot water service will switch on. So you can see there on the uh, bottom line there, divert, hot water service only. So at this stage, we're only diverting energy to the hot water service. As I mentioned before, we have a 400 uh, watt um, hot water service only mode for using whatever available energy there is on a cloudy day. And this is actually a little more important than you think. There are uh, energy diverters for resistive element hot water services that will divert a variable amount of energy to uh, the hot water service. So in case in, in the case where you did have 400 watts of export, you could uh, export just 400 watts. And they use a pulse width, pulse width modulation techniques and switching devices in order to achieve that. Uh, that's a little more complex. I wanted to keep things simple. So the downside of this system here is that it switches a threshold. So if we only had 400 watts being uh, exported to the grid and I determined to switch on the, um, the diverter for the hot water service, then we'd be drawing a net 1.4 kilowatts from the grid but at least I would be using the 400 watts. So that's sort of the logic be behind these modes. And believe it or not, they are, are quite important um, and quite valuable during those winter months on basically heavily overcast days. Uh, the next mode again has hot water service cutting in at 1,000 watts of uh, solar export. Um, same logic as the 400, but in this case, if we had 1,000 watts or more of solar export, uh, then we will be diverting uh, 1,000 watts and we will be drawing from the grid. Um, well, we won't be diverting 1,000 watts. We'd be diverting 1,000 watts to the hot water service and we'd be drawing from the grid 800 watts. This mode here is a, is a dual export mode. Uh, in this case, it's uh, to one of the elect uh, electric vehicles we've got, uh, an i3, and the hot water service. So what we can see here is our real power at the moment being um, exported to the grid is 3.6 kilowatts, and we are diverting now 3.3 kilowatts both to the um, i3 and to the hot water service. Uh, again, um, we have a Mercedes EQC and a hot water service, so now I can divert energy to those two devices as required. Priority goes to the cars with um, based on available um, export uh, energy with the hot water service being a secondary export. Um, I'll maybe cover that off in a little more details later, but there's logic to that in relation to um, charging of ESBs and the stability of EV charging that we want. Third one is the i3 only. Uh, i3 only with a low cut-in, so again, this is for overcast days. Um, the EQC only. And the EQC with a cut-in of 500 watts, meaning that when it, if you know, if you are only exporting 500 watts, you will be drawing from the grid, but you will at least be using 500 watts of energy that you are uh, producing. Uh, the next few modes here just relate to the charging of the EQC, which is a larger car, um, and can be charged at different rates, uh, charge rates, uh, 8 amps through to 16 amps. So I've set uh, various. Uh, cutoffs in here uh, for that. So the first one is an 8 amp uh, charging mode, um, 10 amps, which would be like 2,300 watts, up to 13 amps, uh, which is just over 3,000 watts. Um, I haven't uh, configured the 16 amp mode because I just uh, don't believe I've got enough physical heat sinking on the uh, solid state devices, but I'll come to, um, I'll come to that in a moment. Um, this is for charging both cars, i3 and EQC, with priority going to the i3, and then as energy uh, levels uh, dictate, we can export to one or both vehicles. This one here is uh, exports to the hot water service first, and then if, it's, if there's sufficient energy, then to the i3, and then if there's sufficient energy, to the EQC. Um, the power measurement mode that we saw early basically has no load, no switching, but just measure, measures basically our export um, to the grid. And then we scroll back around. So you could configure 
three modes, you could configure 40 modes. This is the beauty of this system. Um, uh, obviously, um, you don't want too many because you'd be pushing this button forever while you cycle through the modes, but it does work um, uh, very well. The choice of microcontrollers was somewhat uh, driven by um, the coding examples provided in the openenergymonitor.org website. Um, so I had no issues with that. Uh, the Arduino modules are cheap as chips. I did my initial uh, prototyping on using an Arduino Uno, um, but in the end had to move to a Nano because of the uh, greater number of analog inputs that the Nano supports over the Uno. Uh, if you're only on single phase power, then that's not an issue. But in this case, because it's three phase, then I need basically six inputs to measure uh, voltage and current on each phase. And uh, this uh, device, this display device, uh, uses one of the analog inputs as well to uh, drive the display. So I was running out of analog inputs on the UNO and that led me to incorporating the uh, Nano in this final uh, project. Uh, both work equivalently um, and uh, both perform fine. It's just that uh, um, the necessity of additional analog input pins drove me to, um, to this device. As I mentioned earlier, power flow measurement uh, to and from the grid requires measurement of both the voltage on each phase. Um, so if your house runs on a single phase, then that's very easy, uh, but also the current flow on each phase. So uh, you can see three um, AC transformers. Trans uh, basically, are used to drop the voltage from 230 volts down to uh, 9 volts AC. Um, uh, and then through a voltage divider that breaks it down to a further level that can be read by the Arduino. Um, in my case, I've had uh, an electrician uh, break out each of the separate phases through power points. You can't see the third phase below there. Uh, they come into the unit, feed each of these uh, transformers, uh, one per phase, and then the output of that is, is, uh, is run into the Arduino. Um, the downside about this is that then you have AC voltage floating in, in a case. In this case, this is a, a sealed enclosure, a weatherproof enclosure. Um, if you didn't want to do that, the other option would be to take the AC transformers out and use basically um, basic AC plug packs, which are readily available, and they can be plugged directly into the power point, and they will provide um, an AC output that can be fed straight into the uh, voltage divider boards. I thought I might just cover off here the rationale in terms of the switching devices. In this case, um, I've used uh, solid state uh, relays. Um, uh, look, on a lot of Arduino forums, they do have relay switching boards, uh, but you'll find that they are for um, fairly low current type devices. I used them during the testing phase and uh, sure enough one of them did uh, lock up eventually uh, when switching 1800 watts to the hot water service. So even though they're rated I think at, at north of that maybe 2000 watts, 2500 watts, um, they're not going to be uh, productive for you in the long term. Um, the options therefore are relays or contactors or solid state relays. Um, I chose solid state relays because these can be switched directly from the output of the Arduino. Uh, so they take um, a variable input voltage, I think of uh, three volts up to about 20 volts or so. Uh, and based on that switching input, then they can switch an output. And these are rated at oh, uh, phenomenal uh, levels. I think about 40 amps at, um, at uh, 240 volts AC or even higher. Um, I found, however, though, that they do run uh, warm um, and you will feel that when they have 
uh, devices, even at uh, 1.8 uh, kilowatts. They will they will run warm. Uh, I think they've run too warm, and I haven't done detailed calcs on these uh, at 16 amps. So you would need, if you're switching larger capacity loads, then you would need bigger heat sinks than the ones that are included here. But I think these are satisfactory up to about 13 amps at uh, at 230, 240 volts. Um, uh, I suppose the downside of the um, solid state relays is that obviously there is a gate resistance when they are switched on which causes the heat uh, um, in the device or heat generation in the device albeit it's very low um, uh, the other option would be to use uh, contactors or relays heavy duty relays in which case you don't necessarily have then that heat loss because uh, the resistance is, is negligible um, but you may need to switch them, uh, the coils on them may require a 12 volt source to switch. Again, not overly complex, um, but you'd want to consider that. It adds, uh, you know, some more, uh, some more um, electronics in the process just to be able to switch that 12 volts to them, uh, but it's not super complex. I have been happy with the solid state relays, um, and as I say, they've been operating now for about two years. Um, and there's, uh, I've had no issue to date. I mentioned before um, electric vehicles and um, somewhat unique requirements uh, in terms of energy diversion uh, to them. Um, the fundamental difference being is that um, for charging an electric vehicle using an EBSE, electric vehicle supply equipment, um, essentially, once you've commenced a charging process with the car, handshaking is done and the charging has initiated, you don't want to be switching that off and on um, at short intervals. Say, for example, if a cloud passes over, over your house or uh, other appliances in the house pull uh, the available export uh, levels down below the required threshold. Um, you could get away with that with a resistive element hot water service, which you can switch on and off at will. Uh, but for cars, you want a stable um, a charging environment. Um, so what I've done with the code is um, implemented a level of hysteresis, which essentially states that once a charging event has started with a vehicle, that that vehicle or that charging event will run for a predetermined period. In my case, the code's set at 20, 20 minutes from memory. Um, and if the available level of export power drops below the required threshold, even during that 20 minute period, the car will still remain charging. And the positive uh, to that is that there is an, then short term switching and the complexities of that may have with your vehicle and then the restarting of that charging cycle with your car if the power is interrupted. Um, uh, the way the logic works with the hysteresis is that, I'll give, I'll give you an example here, say we're charging the car at a low level at 1400 watts. Uh, we're producing 14 or exporting 1400 watts to the grid. The starting, uh, the charge cycle will start from the diverter. Uh, but then say in five minutes time, um, your dishwasher kicks in operation and the available export to the grid drops to 300 watts. Now, normally that would just stop the charging to the car, but the implementation of hysteresis means that uh, it will continue to charge during that predefined 20 minute period. The logic is such that if during that 20 minute period as well, you start the charging and then the power available power drops below the required threshold, but then exceeds that threshold, say 10 minutes in, then the clock is reset from that period. So if you start the charging now, the power level drops, then in 10 minutes, uh, the sun's out again, then that 20 minutes starts from that period and will keep resetting itself uh, every time the uh, power threshold is exceeded or power export threshold is exceeded. Um, I found the system to be really good. It's worked really well with the cars. Um, I found them also to be reliable in terms of switching off after that predefined threshold and then uh, staying off for whatever period of time and then recommencing a charge session once the power 
uh, exceeded the required threshold again. Um, and I think that's good too because there are contactors in the car and you don't want those switching the whole time and whatever. So um, that approach is great. You can set that hysteresis period um, as you wish from any, any, any period you want, right? But I think 20 minutes for me, I'm, I'm comfortable with. In terms of shortcomings with the system, it's not perfect. Um, in terms of reliably operating as a, as a control module, as a, as a control system, it does its job as, as intended. Um, but it, it's not quite perfect. It has to assume phantom loads and things of that nature in, in the coding logic. Um, but in terms of a simple controlling system, it works really well. Um, so uh, it's not, uh, I don't want to sit here and say it's perfect. Maybe no system is perfect, but this system, for example, meets my specific needs better than any other system I could buy. So I can't really complain. Um, however, look, it's uh, like everything else, uh, being simplistic in its nature and whatever. Um, it does, uh, in terms of its, its logic and how it does operate it, there are some things that are a little questionable. Um, but I encourage you to give it a go in any case and, and see whether you can improve on, on uh, what I've done. Uh, look, also a disclaimer there, I'm not a software developer. Um, I've got an engineering background, but I'm not a so software developer per se. So I'm sure some of you out there will look at this and say, gee, this can be done a bit better than that. And if that's the case, <laughs> good on you and, 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 and you're welcome to it. And if you can share that with others, uh, that would be a wonderful thing because I think this is... Uh, if you look at uh, where OpenEnergyMonitor.org is coming from, uh, it's about sharing of information. I hope I've done some of that today as well, uh, and I'm hopeful you might be able to benefit from that um, and adapt it for your own specific needs. In terms of next steps, for me, I'm happy with it the way it is at the moment. Um, it's doing its job, and, and that's what was intended. Um, Maybe if I get the inspiration one day, maybe um, a Wi-Fi board in there to uh, be um, exporting data to some sort of uh, app where I could actually see the data on this screen but on a phone, uh, and maybe also via the phone to be able to switch the modes on the device uh, might be a nice update, uh, but I'm really not in any rush to do that. It's going to be a little more complex, I imagine, that coding. Um, I'm not in any rush to do it, um, and as a standalone unit at the moment, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. As I said, the cost of this, the most expensive item here in, in, in its construction was, would you believe it, the weatherproof case. Um, the solid state relays are $15, $20 each. The nano really doesn't cost much, neither does the display, and the transformers in this case were, you know, $15 each. So you know, for a in relatively inexpensive project, I think it's had a, it's had a wonderful payback. Um, and it's delivered me something that I just couldn't get um, from commercially available units. Um, I would encourage those wishing to get, you know, to try something, to look at the code I've developed um, and uh, modify it to suit your needs. And, and give it a go. I mean, I, I found it a most enjoyable project, but one that's brought tangible benefit um, to us um, and saved us a bit of time in terms of uh, manual switching that we were doing before. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and um, good luck with your projects.